I'm going to begin by asking, how many of you here today have taken any sort of drug or medication in the past week? Show of hands. Now, how many of you have actually thought about the process that that drug had to go through before it reached your pharmacy and you knew that it was safe to use? Well, this process is called the drug discovery pipeline. And essentially, it does just that, trying to find the one drug that we can use to cure a certain disease on the market and making sure that it's safe to use, so that we can distribute it to people like yourselves to treat certain problems. The process does this by beginning with thousands of different potential drugs and then trying to narrow it down to just the one that we know that is safe to use and also efficable, efficient at combating the disease. In order to narrow down all these compounds, we begin with what we call preclinical screening. Today, this mostly involves animal testing, and essentially, we're just trying to narrow down the many different compounds into just a few that we then take into clinical experiments. And this is where we actually take the drug, and then we give it to human subjects in experiments to make sure that for humans, this drug is, again, safe to use and efficable. So this process as a whole should work. However, currently, it has one major problem. And that's the fact that about 88% of the drugs that pass the preclinical phase then go and fail in the clinical studies. Remember, the preclinical phase should predict what happens in clinical studies. And by having 88% of them fail, this makes the whole process less efficient. And this contributes to the fact that the process itself can cost $2.6 billion and take 10 to 15 years for the development of just a single drug. Now, the problem here, at its core, is the fact that preclinical screening is using animals. And while animals are similar to humans, we're not the same. There are many different drugs that are toxic only to animals, drugs toxic only to humans, and essentially the differences in our physiologies make it so that we can't use animal testing to efficiently model what is happening in humans. Two examples of this, one would be the drug aspirin. How many of you here today have taken aspirin? Show of hands. Did you know that aspirin never would have made it to the market if it went through this screening? And that's because aspirin is toxic in rodents, although it's completely safe to use in humans. Essentially, a drug that you're using today that's on the market never would have made it past this process if it went through preclinical screening, and that's because it's toxic in rodents. Another example would be thalidomide, a drug that's completely safe in rodents, but then it's toxic in humans. It would cause birth defects. And here, these two examples really show the importance of having something more accurate in preclinical screening to model what happens for humans in a more efficient way. So the problem here is how do you make something that's still efficient enough to narrow down thousands of different compounds, but still be accurate enough as if it was all human testing? One emerging solution from the Weiss Institute is called organ on chip. And essentially, this aims to take cells, to grow them in a lab environment on one of these chips, and to simulate as much as possible the environment in humans. Using various technologies, they're able to control the fluids flowing through the chip and trying again to make it as similar as possible to humans. Now, this provides them with the opportunity to add various different drugs to these chips and then measure the response in the cells. Again, making sure that the drugs are safe to use and also they're efficable at solving certain diseases. So this platform currently has two major problems or drawbacks. The first would be that it's low throughput. This means that you have to have one of these chips for each drug that you want to test. And if you remember, there are tens of thousands of different drugs that you want to screen down in preclinical screening. And if you have to make one of these for each one of them, the process as a whole isn't efficient enough. Another problem is that these experiments are done by adding the drug, waiting a certain amount of time, and then looking at the cells and analyzing if they're alive or dead. This doesn't give us any information for what happens throughout the experiment. We can't learn about the drug's mechanics. And also, we're only essentially getting binary information, alive or dead. We don't get any recommendations for how to improve. And this, again, contributes to the inefficiency of the process. In order to meet these drawbacks, the lab that I'm currently interning at, the Nachmias Laboratory from the Hebrew University, came up with this solution, what they call organoids. Essentially, growing cells into spheres and then including specific oxygen sensors in between them. And these oxygen sensors reflect light at a different phase shift, depending on the oxygen concentration. But oxygen is very important, because if we see a high oxygen level in between the cells, that means that the cells aren't using the oxygen available to them. Therefore, they're either under stress or they're dying out. And if vice versa, we see a low oxygen level, we know that the cells are healthy. They are respirating using the available oxygen. 
Then, these sensors allow us to take continuous measurements by, by measuring the phase shift over time, and that means that we can not only see what happened at the end of the experiment, but throughout the experiment, for example, 72 hours, we can measure the effect of the drug to learn more about the drug's effect. Also, by measuring the oxygen, we can learn more about the stress level. Not only do we know if it's alive or dead, we can see the stress of the cells. So the next step was to commercialize this product using a company called Tissue Dynamics, and essentially they have this product that goes, and it's all about the 384 well plate. This is a plate about this big that contains 384 different sections in between it. And the trick is, in each section, you can run one of these experiments with one organoid. As you can see on the bottom left, you have the well, and you have the organoid inside. And this provides you the opportunity to run 384 different experiments all at once. Essentially trying to meet the need of preclinical screening to narrow down many different compounds, you'd be able to take this system, grow the organoid, 384 different organoids, and then this platform is capable of going through for 72 hours and measuring the oxygen level in all of the organoids throughout the experiment. This provides them with the opportunity to take all of this data and then to have something that's both accurate, as in it can see what happens throughout the experiment by oxygen measurements, and also something that's high throughput with 384 well plate. So, when I joined the lab, currently they had a problem with the software. And by this I mean they would run the experiment for 72 hours, measure all the oxygen values, but then in the end, they would have one text file containing about 25,000 different numbers, and they'd have to analyze it to see what happened in the experiment. Previously, they would take this text file, import it into Excel, and after about three days of work, they would come out with a report showing what happened in the experiment. Now, putting aside the fact this was labor-intensive and required expertise, it also introduced bias. And this would be because you had intra-observer bias, different researchers conducting the research slightly different, and also intra-observer bias. The researchers had to repeat it 384 different times, one for each organoid, and you just have human error coming from that. So in order to make it more objective and repeatable, the first thing I did was develop a software capable of importing the text file and immediately showing this color map. Here we can see for each one of the organoids, at the end of the experiment, going from blue to red, blue meaning that the cells are healthy, red meaning that they weren't, and we can learn more about the overview, just looking which drugs were effective at, or which drugs had an effect on the cells, and which ones didn't. But if you remember from earlier, here we're only looking at what happened at the end of the experiment. Again, we only see at the end, we don't learn anything about the drug's mechanics. So in order to solve that problem, the next thing that the platform does is it takes each one of these organoids and it creates one of these graphs, essentially showing the oxygen level in the organoid as a function of the time of the experiment. If you look, in about the first 30 hours, the oxygen level is low, meaning that the cells are using the oxygen and they're healthy. But then at about 30 hours, it begins rising. And here we can see that the drug is starting to affect the cells. The cells are dying out, and they're under stress. And that means that the time to onset, or the time it takes the drugs to start affecting the cells, is at about 30 hours. In order to make the process more objective, we then created an algorithm capable of immediately determining where this time to onset was, marking it on the graph, and then repeating it for all 384 different organoids in the experiment. Then, it takes all these time to onsets, and it puts it back into another color map. In this one we see, going from blue to red, where blue means happening at the end of the experiment, and red meaning an almost immediate time to onset, we can see not only what happened at the end, but how fast acting were these drugs. In this case, black means that the drug didn't have any effect, and therefore the cells were fine throughout. Again, this provides us more information not only about which drugs are toxic, but how fast are they acting, and essentially more information that we can use to determine which drugs continue from preclinical screening. Everything up until now, these experiments, was what we call primary analysis. Essentially, you have 127 different drugs, each one repeated three times, and everything at the same concentration. You're just trying to narrow down many different drugs to find just the few that continue. However, if we want to learn more about the drug's effect, we can take it to what we call secondary analysis. Here, we also take the drug, but this time we vary the concentration over multiple different levels in order to see the effect the concentration has on the drug's effect. So, this was an example from a drug called Valparit, a drug that's available on the market. However, some studies were showing that it had toxicity in certain patients. Analyzing on this platform, we were able to see what we normally see, that as the concentration increases, the effect comes slightly earlier. This means that concentration plays a crucial role in this drug's mechanics. 
From this information, we can calculate the time to onset for each one of these concentrations and then create one of these graphs. Since you here we're comparing the concentration of evaporate on the vertical axis to the time it took evaporate to start affecting the cells, the time to onset. From this, we can see that as the concentration decreases, it takes more time for the time to onset to appear. The lower the concentration of evaporate, the longer it took to start having an effect. From this, we can try and figure out something called LEL, lowest exposure level, where essentially what is the concentration at which we think there will be no effect? What is also the safety margin, the highest concentration we can give this drug at and still know that it'll be safe to use? We calculate the LEL by trying to figure out what concentration will cause an infinite time to onset, essentially trying to take an infinite amount of time for the drug to start affecting the cells, and that is our LEL. Here we're able to calculate an LEL, and shockingly we found that this LEL was actually beneath the recommended maximum concentration for evaporate. Essentially, we could show that perhaps there was a concentration of evaporate that was causing these toxic side effects, and it was because it was given at a too high of a dosage. Then, up until here, we were only looking at concentration, trying to figure out what concentration effect has on the drug. But if we want to learn more about not only if the drug is toxic, at what concentration, but also how is the drug toxic, this is where we come into flux analysis. Essentially, we're also measuring other variables, such as glucose and lactate, trying to figure out what is happening in the cell. So here we have a model of respiration, and they were able to demonstrate that certain mechanics are happening in the cell, and that corresponded to something called lipogenesis, an increase in this, and this is what they were saying is causing the, toxic the toxicity. Now, importantly, this platform, or this specific pathway, is different in animals than in humans. And if we go back to the beginning of the study here, you could see that here, evaporate, which was safe to use in animals, wasn't safe to use in humans because of this difference. And then this platform was able to pinpoint where the problem was. To show up for human cells, as used in this platform, the problem is probably here in lipogenesis. And this information is again crucial in trying to understand why drugs are toxic. Perhaps you can improve the drug from this or learn more about the mechanics. So, at its core, organ on chip has one major trade off, and that would be between throughput and complexity. By this I mean you can either create a problem or a platform that's complex, capable of showing multiple organs coming together, but then it would be low throughput. It's not capable of analyzing many different drugs at once. On the other hand, the platform I showed here today was something that's more high throughput, you could run 384 different experiments, but then it wasn't as accurate. It would only model one type of organoid, and essentially it's not modeling the connections between multiple organs in a body. So although this trade-off exists today in organ on chip, perhaps in the future we'll be able to see a technology that has both something that's also accurate in modeling the entire human physiology while still being high throughput, still being efficient enough at preclinical screening to narrow down those many different compounds. Now, thus far, I've mostly shown the implications of organ on chip on drug discovery, trying to find drugs on the market by pharmaceutical companies in order to help you today. But organ on chip has another implication, and that would be personalized medicine. People found that for a specific drug, for a specific disease, you can give this drug to many different patients that all have the same disease, and yet you'd have different response in the patients. They call this personalized medicine because they learned that different patients can have different characteristics, different DNA, and then you need to have different drugs to treat each patient with the same disease. Here, organ on chip could come in by taking cells from a specific patient, growing them in this lab environment, and then checking many different drugs to see which drug is the best for this specific patient. Essentially, you could take commercial products, bring them into hospitals so that patients could come in, their cells would be taken to biopsy, and then they could see what drug is best for this patient. So, you never know, perhaps in the future, organ on chip will come to your hospital and we'll be able to save your life. Thank you.